Hello, everybody, and welcome to Resurrection Life Church. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us today. My name is Susanna Taylor, and this is our regular Sunday service this morning. We have people watching online, and we have people actually physically present. So it's good to see everybody. Uh, everybody should understand everything right now. We have a good, a, a very good translator, <laughs> and I, I try not to speak too fast for Miriam in the back room. All right. So God bless you. So the first slide I think is already up. We're starting right away. We won't, don't want to go too long. Uh, we start with Philippians, with the scripture in Philippians. You are all very familiar with this scripture. This is not a new scripture for you, but we are going to uh, read it quickly. It's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. You can uh, look in your Bible, you can just look at the screen, whatever is easier for you. It's Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, it's good to see you too. <laughs> so, uh, you know this scripture and you heard just the testimony of Rufina. Uh, everybody, I mean, I think you notice that every single person has a call of God on their life. A very specific call, something very special. Actually, God sent you on this planet to do a specific mission. It does not matter how old you are who you are, what country you are born, God sent you on the earth to do something wonderful for him. You know that, right? You are not just a number on this planet. You are a special person. Special gifts. Only one Omar in 8 billion people. Not a second, not a third, not a fourth, not a fifth. Very unique, very special, with special gifts, special talents, special personalities. So God sent you on this planet to do something wonderful for you. Uh, those uh, We had uh, a missionary just speak in um, uh, before we went online in the church. And what some people don't know, the enemy always sends people across your path to discourage you and to deviate from what God has for you. And, you know, in every country, lady, lady preachers are not accepted in all cultures. We know that. And so sometimes it's a bit harder for them to get started when God has certain things for them. And I have to say, when she first came, or when Rufina first came into this building, and as she told you, she was cleaning the toilets for us. She was doing children's work for a long time. And there were other ministers in the building and other pastors who really, I have to say, everybody was not always nice to her, okay? To the point where she said, I think I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I know God has something, but it's just too discouraging. People talking about you, people, and she helped many ministers to come find the building, actually. She helped people connect with other people. She, she introduced other people to us so we could help them get started, have a church building. And after, many times after she did that, then they threw her under the bus. <laughs> so this happens to all of us, okay? This happens to every single person. You do your best, you work well, you are on your job. And people that you served, that you helped, they have a different agenda. And they literally throw you under the bus. So... Don't be discouraged. Actually, I think her testimony showed that God still can do something with you when nobody believes in you any longer. Okay? His agenda stands. And here's the thing. This scripture says we're looking forward in Philippians. This, we're forgetting what is behind. And that's actually not that easy. When we talk about forget your past, most people say, I'm, I'm past my past. I'm okay. Now I'm going to ask you another question. 
you know how you know if you really look forward most of the time? If somebody, let's say you got into a fight today, you go out on the street and somebody cuts you off in the car, or somebody in the church just tells you something bad before you leave, just offends you, how long are you going to think about that conversation? For most people, it's not just a minute. It's going to be all afternoon. It's going to be the following week. And next Sunday when you come to church, this thing is still going on. And you know what that is? We all do that. Listen, we all do that. It's actually, it's actually not easy to look ahead and run your race. I'm telling you that right now. There is a minister, and he has, he has come up with a rule for himself, the 30 to 60 second rule, to, to smash down these negative thoughts. But the reality is most people are nowhere close to 30 to 60 seconds. I'm not there. I have been, I, I'm catching myself, why am I still thinking about this? This happened yesterday. Where's the 30 to 60 second rule? So we look back. And here's the thing. How well can you run your race by always looking back? It's very difficult, right? It is difficult. How well can you drive your car when you turn your head and look what's going on back there? How far will you drive your car? Not very far, right? So, to look forward, um, let's go with only, I'll give you the scripture here. We're not going to read the whole chapter because you already know this. Let's go to Genesis 19. Actually, we're not reading it. I'm just giving you the reference. You can look this up at home. But we want to look forward to the wonderful things that God has for you and me. Amen. Actually, the signs and wonders is when you look forward, when you go forward. People always want to have signs and wonders, but they always look back. Past is past. Nothing is going to happen back here, okay? Only when you run forward, when you go forward. In Genesis chapter 19, and we know the story that, uh, about Abraham and Lot. The story is world famous about Sodom and Gomorrah. Every sinner knows this story. And here, actually, in Genesis 19 is where the angels, listen, guys, angels came to Lot's house, not just people, angels. And when the angels showed up, they said a big tragedy is going to hit these cities. Lot, take your wife, take your daughters, take your future son-in-laws. Um, we need to help you. We need to get you out of here. So angels showed up. We note that we know that even um, the son-in-laws, they or, or the future son-in-laws, they didn't care. They said they laughed at him. Yeah, yeah, right. Something is going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sure, sure, sure. You guys just go on your own. Here's the thing: angels in person told Lot and his wife. They only gave him two instructions. Listen, two things. It was funny. On Friday, we had a special meeting, the believers meeting, and Monica was here, and she told everybody, hey, guys, everybody only got max 12 minutes, max 12 minutes to give everybody a chance. You know, it's not so easy for us people to follow instructions. I mean, it's clearly said in the my cloud, everybody 12 minutes. Everybody, 12 minutes, no more than that. We want him to speak, him to speak. She has to say something, everybody, 12 minutes. But we're getting better, actually. But that's only one instruction. And everybody in one room is not able to follow one instruction. That's just a fact. You can go in any school. You can go to any job. Tell everybody, I don't know, um, you can go to your cafeteria. One instruction, and people cannot follow it. Here's the thing with God. We need, all of us, we need to learn to follow instruction. This may be able to save your life one time. Not following instruction is not just disobedience and rebellion. It is. But you know what? It may kill you in the long run. So God is not complicated. God makes stuff simple. It's it really, it's so simple. God makes stuff very simple for us. But how many of us, we're reading stuff in the Bible and say it's for somebody else. Tithing is for somebody else. Going to church is for somebody else. Forgiveness is just for Omar. Um, think about that next year, when next year comes around, and you hope next year comes around, okay? <laughs> you really do. 
So we have a hard time. Go to any school. What is the trouble? The teachers teach and teach and teach, and the kids do the opposite. My sister is a school teacher. Guess what? When the kids should sit in the chair, and they know they're supposed to sit in the chair, that's not complicated. You don't need no IQ for that. You don't need to know any language for that. They will sit under the chair, on purpose, under the chair. They will sit under their desk. She's, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, this didn't happen, okay? We had different disciplines. <laughs> but nowadays, you tell the kids, sit in the chair. Where do you find them? Everywhere else but on the chair. So this is really a serious issue, not just for the kids, actually for you and me. Um, there is countries, you know, the red light doesn't mean anything. Red is green, green is red, yellow is whatever, you know, anything goes. But with God, this will be hard to go on the road ahead with God like that. When we always change every instruction, when we always have a better idea about every instruction. So listen, angels, angels, when was the last time an angel showed up in person physically in your house? I don't know. Some of you may have happened. Angels showed up at Lot's house. A supernatural intervention. Supernatural destiny for this family. Supernatural mission. Supernatural deliverance for the family. The angels gave him two. Two instructions. And two only. Not complicated to understand. There was not a crowd of 100 people where everybody was talking and some people couldn't pay attention. They said, do not look back. When we are going with you and do not stop you don't look back you march with us and we're not gonna stop two instructions it was only four people plus the two angels one out of the four could not follow instructions and what did the lady do we all know it the whole world knows it you can see it she looked back and what happened to her what happened to her? Yes, she became a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt. Now, my question is, actually, it's a deep question. It's not my question. It's the Holy Spirit's question. How many of your lives or my life have become a pillar of salt because we're constantly looking back? And we're telling God, where are the miracles? Where is the deliverance? Where is my healing? Where are my connections? Where is the blessing? But we do not follow instructions. Paul said very clearly, I do one thing, he said. This one thing I do. Forget what is behind me and look forward, run forward. One instruction. How many of us, and listen, I'm guilty just as you, okay? <laughs> How many of us turn around to the noise in the background, to the voices and the screaming behind me? How many of us always turn around? <clears throat> Here's the thing. People always want prayer. I need prayer for deliverance, for a job. I need prayer for, 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 to get out of my situation. You know what, what the, the, the really terrible thing is? Lot's wife was delivered. When the fire fell, they were already outside the city. She was delivered. She was already in a place of freedom and blessing. But she didn't get it. She lost it. How many of us have received the blessing, have received freedom, have received healing, have received deliverance? When the first symptom hits, what do you do? You look back, I, maybe I'm not healed. And you turn, your area turns in that, in that, your life turns like a pillar of salt. And it's not God's fault. God is too good. It's not the church's fault. It's not your brother's fault. It's not your husband's fault. Not your children's fault. We have trouble. I have trouble follow to follow one instruction and one instruction only and people they always want to talk to you and some people don't want to talk to you about their past but here here I'm coming back to this what about your thought life what about my thought life it, it would really it honestly uh, 
our thought life's run rampant. If we had right now a TV screen for every single person in here, oh my gosh, it is worse than Netflix. Do you know how many movies will be running? And not just one for each person. Every person has about 10, 20 movies running at, in the same hour, okay? You're like those guys that flip the channel all the time, a uh, hundred channels. This is what you, in my mind, often looks like. It's not even on one channel. It goes here and here and here. My daughter, my husband, my job. I came too late to church and what's going on? And my money and tomorrow I have a bill and then I should take the train and I don't know, maybe my vacation and my kids and what's going on? And, uh, I like this. A thousand movies running non-stop. And you know what that is? Looking back. Looking back. And here it takes a lot. How should I say? This is a process actually. This will not happen overnight to anybody. The people's problem is not their sickness. The people's problem is not they don't have money. The people's problem is not that somebody was mean to them that the kids acted up or didn't obey, that's not your problem. Your problem and my problem is a, con a, a mind that runs in a thousand directions. An undisciplined mind. An undisciplined mind. That's actually, you know what? That's spiritual warfare. Forget about casting out demons and praying a million times. You go home after church, you do your own thing with your mind, you are, you are no better off than when you came to church. You're no better off before or after prayer, it doesn't even matter. God said, keep your mind stayed on me. That's not a popular scripture, and that's a scripture that I would say most of us all have serious problems following. Keep your minds on God. When people act up, when things go wrong on your job, when people do you wrong, when you think about your own hobbies, your own desires, actually, most of the time, listen, guys, in all of our movies, the 10 movies that are running through our heads right now, for me, it's less because I have to speak right now, so I'm, uh, I have to focus, you know. <laughs> but as soon as you sit there, your mind, oh my gosh, your mind just goes off. But guess who is the main actor in all of your movies? It's you, it's me. We are the superstars in our movies. And we show everybody, I mean, in our mind, how the outcome is. And all the other people are the little actors and the supporting actors around us. We are the superstars in our thoughts. That is looking back. All these movies in our minds is looking back. Here the Bible says, and we go to the end, God even uses animal to give a, uh, bring a point across the ends. And it says in Proverbs 30, 25, Proverbs 30, 25, the end is a forward-looking animal. Very simple, not nice. We're not impressed with ants, are we? No. We actually, we try to kill them. When they get in our homes, we don't want ants, okay? We don't want no ant colony. So ants, they are creatures of little strength. Look how little they are compared to you. I mean, you squash them. They're so little. Ants is nothing. This is weird. Yet they gather their food in the summer for the winter. They look forward. They don't go to last year. In the summer, they already prepare for what's ahead, for what's coming. It's just a little animal. Maybe we're too intelligent. <laughs> Maybe that's our problem. We're too smart for our own demise, for our own downfall. So if the little animal can do that, look forward. And it says in one scripture, they're very diligent. They use every effort to look forward, to prepare, to gather their food for the winter. If a little animal can do that, do you think you having the Holy Spirit inside of you, me, do we think this is possible? It is possible. But you know, it, the ant says they work very hard all summer. For you, listen guys, this is not going to be automatic. Mind control is not automatic. Disciplining your mind is not automatic. That is something, first of all, you have to check, uh, um, get arrested 
the moment you start thinking about somebody's conversation about yesterday. Say, well, I'm still thinking about this. Maybe you need to give somebody an answer, fine, that that will be okay. If you need to write somebody or call somebody or give somebody an answer, okay. But if something troubles you, you need to think, why is this thing still running through my mind? And, and listen, guys, this is the, one of the reasons, I don't say the only reason, one of the reasons why people end up in mental hospitals, they never learned to control their minds. And listen, I'm not accusing those people. I don't say it's their fault. We have not been teaching people that stuff. We tell people, basically, we never talk about this. To discipline your mind, to control your mind, to arrest your mind. We don't even know. We don't even know what the scripture means to take every thought into captivity. We don't know what that means. Here's the thing. This is not an easy thing, but there is a way to do it. And uh, maybe you say, but how do I do that? How, how can I look forward? How can I control my mind? What do I need to do that I don't constantly look back? Constantly look back. Um, what do I need to do? And here's the thing. First, you have to understand you will be tempted as soon as the service is over. Maybe some of you are already tempted right now because somebody sent you an SMS and you're checking your phones during the preaching. Okay? So, so somebody sent you a message. You go, no way. What is going on? So, but listen, as soon as we're done here, you will be tempted that your mind goes into a certain direction. We said several weeks ago that your mind is like a boat. It constantly drifts away on the ocean. That boat will not stay automatically on the dock. What do you need to do to, for it to stay on the dock? What do you do? Nobody has a boat in here? You have to tie it. Exactly. You need to tie it. So how do you tie down your mind so it doesn't always swim off across to America, to South America? What do you do with your mind? There's a way to do this, but what do you do? What? Yeah, but how do you arrest the thought? Do you get the gun? Like the cops, a gun? You get, how do you arrest the thought? You talk, but what? Yeah, scriptures, not a bad idea. Good, good start. <laughs> you talk scriptures. Hey, you guys are totally good. You talk a scripture. Now, what is the average the Christians read their Bible a day? Somebody? Yeah, how much, how much do the average Christian read their Bible a day? How much? 50 minutes. You're still, you're still among the not lukewarm Christians <laughs> with, 50 minutes, uh, with 50 minutes a day. You're good, actually. And listen, guys, I don't know what the, what the statistics are, but there have been statistics out in the past. Um, broken down, I'm not sure if it's one or two minutes, if, one or two minutes, if a day. The fact is most everybody in here, online, in the world, no matter what country, what continent, they, we do not read the Bible every day. Fact, full stop. So how are you going to arrest your thought if you're not in the Word? It's hard. It's hard. And maybe that's the reason we really got away from the Word. We got away from the Word. We, have, uh, we are not used to following any instructions. Any instructions. And if somebody actually has the audacity to quote the word to you or give a scripture as an answer, but, but what? It's always an argument, a conversation, a discussion about the word. And the word does not need any discussion. God put it the way it is. But we don't know it. And when we know it, then we are so bold to, to put it under discussion. I think this may mean this or this may mean that. Don't look back. How difficult is that? Don't look back. Okay, but I can look left. They didn't tell me I couldn't look left. And maybe here I can see a bit there. Nobody said in scripture I could not look right. Let me try. So we have the word up for discussion. We found a thousand ways in gymnastics how we are going to not going to follow that one instruction straightforward about forgiveness. Oh, don't even talk about that. 
no, you know what Jesus even said? Jesus said, if you don't forgive, I don't forgive you. You know that people actually are in hell because they refuse to forgive? It's not a joke. This scripture is not up for 10 interpretations. If Jesus said, if you don't forgive, I don't forgive, where do your sins go? They stay. So we, we are really, we have such a, how should I say, a popular gospel that we have been preaching for so many years for the people to tickle their ears, for the people to make happy. And when you tell people, same thing here, and listen, I, I don't want to tell you nothing, but when we say, or anybody, school, work, it starts at 8 o'clock. People come at 8.15. What is that? Not following instructions. And here's the thing. I don't think you're a bad person. But whatever you do in one area, not following instructions, will carry over in another area. Wherever you slack off in one area, okay, maybe, oh, he didn't say I couldn't look right. He didn't say. Just a bit. It's not so bad. Just two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. I mean, and God tries to help us. He really tries to help us. I love my mic. Sorry, guys. Are we back here long? Can you hear me? <laughs> I dropped my mic. Can you hear me? Oh, I need, to, I need to keep talking, actually, because it's delayed always, what's coming. I need to keep talking. Sorry, guys. Okay. It's like it's not going in all the way for whatever reason. Is it good? Okay, we're good. We're good. All right. Sorry, guys. Okay. So what is this? Again, see? Distraction. <laughs> it was my fault. <laughs> I dropped the mic. So, um, yes. What is this that we always, like an elastic band... The instructions are given. We always stretch them a little bit. It's okay. It's okay. Always a little stretching. Always a little stretching. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still within the line. I'm still within the line. You know, the people, the Israelites that were always on the outskirts of the camp. I'm still in the camp. When calamity hit, who were the first ones to get struck and burned up and eaten up? the people that were always right at the border, right at the line. And we Christians, you know what we try to do? Let me see how much I can do in my way and still get blessed. This is our modern theology of today. Okay? And this is actually, it's, it's really, this is why so many Christians, you had when you were children, you had dreams, you had visions. Even in school, God showed you things. You had things that you wanted to do for God. And after you turned 20, then it was 25, then it was 30, then 35, and older and older. Where is God? I'm nowhere in life. The dreams have died. We just coast along. Where is God? And then what the most people do after that, we start getting angry with God because God doesn't come through for us. God does not do what's, what is saying in the word. But how well do you and I follow instructions? It's really serious. It's serious. You cannot even get five people on the same page, honestly. Even in a prayer meeting with three people, everybody's arguing. What should we, should we pray and what should we this? Or, or if the leader says we start right now, no, I want to first give a testimony. I mean, really, what is wrong with us? We, we are corrupted, really, and that is from the world. This has come inside our churches, inside our belief system. I do it my way. And, but I'm still obedient, almost obedient. I'm still obedient, almost obedient. You know, we are kind of blessed in the New Testament that God is so gracious. He gives many of us many chances. Some people did not have a second chance. Do you understand that Esau did not have a second chance? Some people that did not follow instructions never got a second chance. So how many chances does God have to give you and me before we get, up, get on with it? 
again, we're gonna we're closing now. We're closing, but I want to still show you uh, how to look forward. And here's the thing: reading the Bible once in a while. If if you really want to follow God, if you really want to reach your destiny, you reach your mission, fulfill your mission. Actually, the truth is in the Bible, there's very few people where the Bible says that they finished their assignment. With David, it says he fulfilled God's purpose in his generation. Paul said, I finished my race. And we know that John, after he wrote Revelation, he did what God called him to do. But let me ask you, how many people does the Bible say this guy did from A through Z what God sent him on the planet for? And it's really, it's, oh, it's scary. It's actually scary. We need to ask God to help us, really. We, but the first thing we have to do is repent and say, God, forgive me for not following instructions. Because the Bible says, you know what the Bible even says to Jesus? He says, I'm easy to please. It's not even complicated. He's easy to please. His words are not hard. It's easy. He says, I, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why do you make it so complicated? And here's the thing that will help us to look forward. We need to fill our thoughts. Number one, of course, is with the word of God. Outside the word of God, I'm telling you right now, Nobody outside the Word of God will fulfill the mission that God sent them on this planet for. That's not possible. Because you will have to discover yourself in the Word of God. All of you, I'm not sure if you know this, did you know that you are in the Bible somewhere? Did you know that? Your name is not there, but your assignment is there. The Bible says Jesus found himself in scriptures. When he was reading Isaiah, he go, the Holy Spirit showed him, that is me. That is my job description in Isaiah. You have, you know what? How are you going to discover your mission if you're not reading your Bible? Every single person in here should, should have scriptures where it says, the Lord called me to do this. This is my gift. This is my talent. I'll give you an example. Uh, and we're closing shortly. I was always, you know, I, I, um, when I read about Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul, sometimes they, they used to fight with one another, like cats and dogs. Uh, this is from church history. You have to study with Krenner to know that. One day, and you won't, won't believe that, but it's, it's really from church history, Paul and Barnabas beat each other up physically. They were Christians. Born again, spirit filled, all in the ministry, they beat each other physically because Barnabas said, I want to give John Mark, I think it was his cousin or nephew, it's a bit different there, but uh, what it is, it was his relative, a young dude who, who was working with them. And then one day he just left and said, You guys just do your own mission, I'm gone. Goodbye, said John Mark. See you later somewhere else, maybe. I mean, you couldn't count on him. It's like you have people that need to sing or clean. One day they're here, one day they're not here. That was John Mark. Okay, today I sleep in. You guys do your own breakfast. I, I'm, I'm coming this afternoon. I, I'm just show up whenever I want. So Paul was so mad because they went to an important mission. And this dude, John Mark, is just a young, no good, lazy, probably mousy, I don't know, just no good dude. And they started, oh, they got into an argument. And Barnabas, Barnabas said, give him one more chance. Paul said, no. It got really to the point where they beat each other up. Then we know that Paul chose Silas, and they went off in a direction, and Barnabas chose John Mark and went off in another direction. About where you find yourself in the Bible, I have not forgotten. Well, the Holy Spirit reminded me. Where do you find yourself in the Bible? When I would read this about Barnabas, I always like Barnabas. I like this thing about getting another chance. I really love this thing. And so for me, um, on every job, on every, Paul, is, uh, Barnabas, actually, that's not his real name. I think his real name was Joseph, if I'm not mistaken. Barnabas was not his real name. They nicknamed him Barnabas because Barnabas means comforter, encourager. It means encourager. He, he was so good with people to give them another chance to say, you can do this. Come on, let's do this together. 
And when I started in the Bible, I always liked it. And I know one, one of the different things is I like to encourage people. That's one of my things, whether it's on the job, whether it's with the kids, it does not matter. I don't always holler at them or scream at them if somebody makes a mistake. I always like that. So I found one thing, and I always wrote that down. What is one of my callings? I always write down Barnabas and an encourager. I found myself in Scripture. You can find yourself in Scripture. If you're not reading the Bible, not sure what you're going to find. <laughs> Maybe what you read in a magazine at the kiosk or what you saw on TV. Yeah, in Brazil, everybody knows their mission. Every man in Brazil is a soccer player, and every girl wants to be a model. But they found those callings on TV and not in the Bible, okay? <laughs> and then sometimes it doesn't turn out so well. Sometimes it does. But it may be far away from uh, what God actually called these people to be, okay? <laughs> now, John Mark. Who is John Mark? Where does he appear in the Bible? Come on, guys. By the way, I found out. I did, this will be, it'll be of interest to you. I found out in some history readings, remember that guy when Jesus was crucified and, and, and they were arresting everybody and one guy ran away naked. You remember that guy? History thinks it was John Mark. The, so John Mark actually saw Jesus, but he was very young then. And they think, they think, but this is not 100% confirmed, that his mother may have hosted the Last Supper for Jesus. But this is not 100% but he was a young, a young, yeah, a teenager. Just no good. A teen no, teenagers are good. Um, I'm actually four teenagers. <laughs> but he just acted sometimes not so properly. Where else is John Mark in the Bible, guys? Come on. What? Where? Yes, he's in the book of Acts. Yeah, of course, because of Barnabas. Exactly, they travel together. Who is John Mark? And this will blow your socks off if you didn't know. John Mark is the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Hello. That is awesome. You know how he did that? Because of one guy, Barnabas, who still believed in him after he messed up. Isn't that beautiful? So find your calling. Find your mission in the Scriptures. Start reading the Scriptures. You are unique. You are special. God has a special place for you. And then, of course, the Word of God. Here's another thing that will help you to keep going down straight the road without looking back. back. Um, and actually, this is such a godly principle that the world tries to copy this. You think about His faithfulness, His goodness, His grace, and His mercy. When you fill your thoughts, in Philippians says, whatever is honorable, whatever is noble, whatever is true, not what is negative, not the last gossip, not what you read in the newspaper, not how many people already died of COVID and the shot. When you start filling your things with the words of God, whatever is pure, honest, of good report, that's when we start walking forward. The world copied this and they call this positive thinking, okay? Okay. And they stole this principle. And guess what? It works in the business world. Those people that follow that. I had a secular coach many years ago. And he said, I quit watching the news a long time ago. It's only nonsense and lies and negative and no good. When I heard him say that, and this man is not a Christian, you know what? I said, you know what? I think I don't need to watch any news, really. I don't watch the regular news that comes on here. I watch some under other channels with some other information. I don't, I, we don't even have a TV. I never watch the, the national TVs and newscasts ever. What a, maybe the weather. I, I flip up, open a page to see what the weather is like. Even that is manipulated, by the way. Even that they lie about. <laughs> so if we, do, if we have to learn, you and me, and we're closing with this, to fill our thoughts, pure thoughts, Every time a negative thoughts come, this person didn't do this, this person let me down. Those, that moment you have these thoughts, you need to stop. And you cannot just hit the thoughts. You have to replace them with something. This is like a tire. If you take a tire off because it's blown, because it's bad, you don't keep running on three tires. Actually, you can't. But some of you try to do that. 
to always ride on three tires. You need to put another new tire on there. And the new tire is in your mind. That's why uh, um, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, renew your mind. You must do it daily. It's not enough once in a while, once a week, every few months. And we will close with this. Smith Wigglesworth, and people look up to him because he raised about 23 people from the dead. He had signs, wonder, miracles, God knows what. And he was an outstanding man with an outstanding ministry. He, he ministered in Switzerland. All the people would get healed um, many years ago. But, you know, the man said, I don't go longer than 20 minutes without reading my word. And people say, you're just crazy. You, yeah, well, you're crazy. But this guy finished his race. He's crazy. Okay, he's crazy. Then one day they went to, to, uh, to go to the, the swimming pool or somewhere or a river where you go, uh, you know, swim in the summer. And some guy said, I'm going to see now. This guy is lying. How can he go? We're hanging out. Hey, we're chilling. We're eating ice cream. We're swimming. Uh, how is he going to read the Bible? After 20 minutes, Smith Wigglesworth pulls up his trunk and the little Bible was strapped to his leg. And he said, stop. I'm going to read the Bible right now. When he would ride with people in the car and have a conversation about your ministry, about what are we going to have for lunch? We're going to the next city. <coughs> After 15, 20 minutes, Smith would say, that's not good. We need to talk about God. We talked enough about natural stuff. That was a guy. His face was set like flint. He finished his race. We can do this, guys, but it will be a learning process, okay? And it will take much discipline. This is not happening automatically. But you can do this. If John Mark could do it, you can do it. And he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Let's see what you're going to write in your life, what the mighty exploits you're going to do, what songs you're going to write, the people that are going to be healed and raised from the dead under your hands. If he could do it, you can do it. You are not too old. You are not too small, not too big, not too educated, not too uneducated. You don't have enough problems. John Mark could do it. You can do it. Okay? Amen. So let's, um, uh, yeah, we'll go offline here. So we thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next broadcast.